Welcome to Rehash, a Web3 podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Rehash, a Web3 podcast. I'm your host, Diana Chen. And today we're speaking with Daisy Alioto, co-founder and CEO of Dirt, about the intersection of media and Web3. Dirt is a daily newsletter about pop culture and entertainment, especially TV. And similarly to Rehash, Dirt uses NFTs to reward contributors for their work and enable community participation and governance in the future of Dirt. But before we dive into our conversation with Daisy, here is a quick word from the Web3 projects that helped make this season possible. Web2 Social has become a world of walled gardens, where platforms own your data, your content, and your community. But Lens Protocol is a community garden, a user-owned, composable, and decentralized ecosystem designed to let Web3 social apps bloom. When you create content on Lens, you own it, you control it, you take it with you from app to app, and you decide how it's monetized. Instead of chasing ads and algorithms, you set the value of your work and your community collects it directly from you. Here at Rehash, we'll be experimenting with this ourselves by posting all content from season three on Lens, where our community can now truly interact and grow with us. So bring your photos and videos, your GMs and your friends, and come join the new era of social media on Lens Protocol. Go to claim.lens.xyz to claim the last social media handle you'll ever need. And be sure to follow rehash.lens. Contributing to a DAO can feel like this. Contributing to several DAOs can feel like this. But it doesn't have to. With Avenue, you can filter out the noise, get to know more DAOs, and start contributing right away. Avenue allows contributors to form organic teams to work together on the things they love. This means DAOs can operate, coordinate, and collaborate at a scale that used to be impossible. Because working together in a DAO should be like making music. The drummers drum, the singers sing, and when collaboration leads the way, a song emerges. No more relying on the core team to get things done. It's time to get your community contributing. To give your DAO the information they need to know, the tools they need to self-organize, and the spaces they need to work together, visit avenue.place. Hey guys, thanks for hopping on here. I just wanted to touch base real quick. What's up, Diane? What's up? So first of all, I just wanted to say thanks, Tyler, for taking these meeting notes. They look great. Uh, I didn't take those. I'll take credit for it, though. Wait, that wasn't you? Do we know who it was? And who's been posting those hilarious meme videos on our Twitter? Oh, I have no idea. Uh, there's a lot going on here, though. Like, how are we supposed to keep up with what everyone's doing? I don't know. It feels like pure chaos being in a DAO sometimes. Ellie, what was that thing you were talking about that helps DAO contributors like add and organize all of their contributions? Oh yeah, it's called Govern. It's like GitHub for DAO contributors. Ooh, that sounds cool. How does it actually work? Yeah, so it's actually a protocol where DAO members can add any task they've completed as a contribution. And then their fellow DAO members can attest to them to confirm that those contributions were valid without the need for a core team to do so. What you end up with is a simple bottom-up way for members to build out the DAO's contribution graph themselves. It gives contributors more power and freedom, it makes it a lot easier to accurately reward everyone, DAO members actually own all of their contributions, so if they want to jump into another DAO, they can actually prove they know their stuff. Okay, okay, I'm sold. Um, can it be on-chain? Of course, but on Gnosis chain, so transactions are super cheap. Ooh. All right, yeah, I'm down. Diane? Yeah, for sure, let's set it up. Uh, what's the link, Ellie? Just go to govern.app, and that's govern without the E, so G-O-V-R-N dot app. Perfect. All right, well, if you guys got this, I got to jump back to another call. Hey, Daisy, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for being here. So before we dive into Web3 Media and all things Dirt, can you just tell listeners a little bit about your background, where you came from, how you initially got into media, and then eventually into Web3? Sure. So I have worked in media for almost a decade. I worked on the audience development side, so social media and community building, which is really sort of at the intersection of editorial and marketing. And I think prepared me to see the opportunity around Web3 technology and the ability to build a media brand. 
I worked for established brands at like Time Inc. and Condé Nast and New York Magazine, but I also worked for media startups like Airmail and First Look Media. So I really kind of saw the full gamut of revenue structures and, and types of media over the course of, I guess, what you would call the digital media boom, which were kind of at the end of the arc for that, especially for media that's funded solely by digital advertising. Dirt came about because Kyle Cheka, my co-founder and I, really had a lot of overlap in our intellectual interests. We didn't feel like there were enough venues for smart, but sort of weird, hard to categorize writing about entertainment and the internet. And so we launched Dirt mainly just as a venue for our thoughts and the thoughts of people that we were close to. And then we started selling NFTs to fund seasons of Dirt so we would be able to bring in more contributors. And from there, I think we really started to see the opportunity to build out a whole media ecosystem using some of this web free tooling, but also using our backgrounds in media and storytelling and knowing what actually makes compelling content. And so we went out and we raised a seed round for Dirt and are currently in the process of expanding our platform. That's awesome. So having worked in the Web2 media space for so long, for a decade or more than a decade, looking back now, like what were some of the biggest I guess, problems that you could see in the Web2 media space that, you know, maybe now you realize Web3 could help fix? Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, digital ad revenue that never fully replaced revenue from print ads. So magazines that were previously, like if you think about the Vogue September issue, the fact that like, you know, it was this huge magazine book and then you had print ads in there, the revenue that they would get from running that same ad online did not replace the decline of print. And then a huge one was algorithmic social media. Um, All of these algorithms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Google ads, are just sort of siphoning off value from that content. And even though there were publishers who were able to strike deals with certain platforms, again, like the amount of value that was created was mainly accruing to the platforms themselves and not actually to creators. So I think Web3, A, to go back to the digital ad revenue model, there's an opportunity for stuff to be more community supported. And then for the algorithm, like there's an opportunity for people to sort of self-select into more gated communities where you can monetize based on the depth of engagement and less incentivized to create content that can be just spewed as widely as possible as clickbait, which is how people were sort of beating or gaming the algorithm for a long time. Um, And so we're exiting this sort of Web2 period of gaming the algorithm and entering this period where we're creating, I think you could kind of use the term like walled gardens, where you're identifying something that's familiar to tech. And I hear people talk about a lot from the tech world, which is product market fit. And I sort of think about it as product audience fit where you can have more audience-driven products that are living on this Web3 tooling or the blockchain. Yeah, so I think this digital ad revenue model is something that everybody has seen to be problematic. Everybody gets served so many ads every day on all of these platforms that they don't care about uh, except honestly, I have to shout out Instagram because like Instagram has the algo down so good. Like mm-hmm. I have bought so much stuff off Instagram ads. I'm embarrassed to say, but anyway, um, in Web three, then now that we've identified the problem, what do you see as replacing the digital ad revenue model in Web three? Like, how are platforms mm-hmm. going to make money so that they can stick around? Or you know, maybe or maybe this isn't the right way to think about it. Like. Maybe there's going to be brand new models and we can't sort of compare everything one-to-one between Web 2 and Web 3. I think you're asking the right question. I think it's a fair question to ask. And it's something that we thought a lot about, especially as we were pitching investors. And like, to be honest, like we're in Web 2.5, like people have different terms for it, but like, that's where we are. That's where the consumer is. Um, If they're even so far along into the (laughs) 0.5, a lot of them are at two. Um, And we're onboarding a lot of people through dirt. Um, I think there's a few ways I want to answer that question. First is we, in Pitching Dirt, were using this idea of a streetwear brand. Um, If you think of a brand like Supreme, 
where there's all of these sort of pathways to fandom and collectability around Supreme, where you can be a super collector of Supreme. Like if you are a fan of Supreme, you can buy the Metro card and the skate deck and the plushie, what have you. There's really no limits on it, um, except for brand overexposure, which is a whole other conversation. Um, for media, there's like nothing like that. Like you can buy a subscription, you can buy a tote bag, maybe you can buy a hat. But if you're a super fan of The New Yorker, there's no way for you to give them more money. And what we saw from the wallets that were participating in the Dirt crowd funds when we were selling NFTs on this sort of seasonal basis is that when we took the amount that we raised and we divided it by the number of wallets participating, we found that the average person participating in the Dirt ecosystem had given us $500 over the course of less than a year, which is way more than we could plausibly charge for a subscription for the type of publication that we are. Um, and so we realized that there's really this need for more of a streetwear model around media, which Web3 could support, where people are giving you money through multiple pathways. They're giving you money to participate in the DAO. They might be buying a sort of one-off NFT when you do limited edition drops. Um, and they also might be buying an annual subscription NFT, that, which represents their ability to access certain content. Um, and so that was like a big unlock for us. The other thing I wanted to say is that if you look at that digital ad revenue model, people were sort of collecting data, like demographic data, like somebody's email address, somebody's home address, to try to create and extrapolate like a consumer portrait from that data. Basically, like they want to know how old is this person? What is their gender? What kind of device are they using? All so that they could predict what this person is going to buy and then sell to that type of advertiser. With the blockchain and wallets, you actually have sort of the inverse of that, where if somebody is using a hot wallet or they're using a wallet that they use for other things, we actually have a complete portrait of that person's consumer behavior on the blockchain. So these questions of like, how old is this person? Where do these, where do they live? They're way less important. And so the other thing that we're trying to do in thinking about monetizing dirt in different directions is beginning to think of the wallet address as the new fundamental unit of consumer data rather than an email address or a home address. And in doing that, like allowing for a scenario where people are actually retaining their privacy, you know, like there's no point at which that person is going to have to pair their wallet address with an email address to us in order to participate in the community. They might be able to do that optionally, but it's not going to be a requirement. Um, and so we're giving people some of their privacy back, but we're actually learning more about them. Um, and it won't be us selling that data because anybody will be able to see what wallets are in the dirt ecosystem. Advertisers will be able to scrape that already. And so rather than us like collecting all that data and selling it to advertisers, they're going to be coming to us and saying, wow, like, holy shit, like, you know, 80% of your community is also holding a like, you know, a leisure pass, like, please let us advertise our seltzer to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. It kind of reminds yeah. me of, I don't know if you've seen um, Bello. It's like a new app that mm -hmm. the uh that Adam Levy, he's like the guy that hosts the Mint podcast, he just released, but it it what it does is so like for dirt, for instance, you could look at all the people that hold a dirt NFT and you could analyze their wallet in other ways. So you could see like the average age of their wallet. You could see other NFTs that these wallet holders own as well. So maybe like dirt NFT holders are also like big holders in like Lil Nouns, for example, or like Crypto Coven NFTs or whatever. And so that way you can kind of get a sense of what other, like what their aesthetic is, what they look for in NFT projects. Like, do they care about community? Do they care about the art? Do they care, like, what do they care about? And then also, I think you can also see the average price they spend on an NFT, which is helpful to know when you're trying to price out your NFTs um, to your audience on like, okay, well, I know like on average, this is how much they spend. So if I price mine at that range, in that range, like it'll probably, it's likely to sell sort of thing. So yeah, we're, I think we're seeing tools yeah. like that already. Yeah. I think those types of analytics are going to be really important. And when I was pitching dirt, we had 200 wallets in the ecosystem. So I actually did all of it manually. Um, and I, I was able to like create a giant spreadsheet. I looked through everyone's wallet. And so I was able to clean some of that quantitative stuff, but just also qualitative, like, what is the aggregate taste of this group, which I think is something that like, that sort of like human 
touch is going to stay really, really important, especially around creating content. So that's how I was able to see that like a third of these wallets had actually bought their first NFT from Dirt. And that was like a really powerful statistic for investors because they were like, wow, like this is a project that's bringing people in and they're not bringing in like just anyone. They're bringing out people who were tastemakers and and cultural consumers in Web2, exactly the type of people that we want to find a home in Web3. And so that was a really powerful analytic as well. Um, and I was doing it manually, but I was like, well, somebody's going to build this. So, you and know, somebody did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's an is- easy way to get that number. There's a hard way to get that number. Yeah, that's I mean, that's super impressive that you went through all of that. And I think that's also a really powerful stat that a third of your holders are that was the first NFT they ever bought, which um you know, I was going to ask Bought or too, received because some of them had created a wallet to received. receive a free NFT as well, which is also like, I think creating a wallet is actually the biggest consumer stumbling block. And we like my thing that I say over and over again is like the most powerful market is for Web3 is people who don't have a crypto wallet yet. You know, what are you building and creating for them? Because um, the size of that market is bigger than the size of any other market. Yeah. So when you first created Dirt, is that something that you had in mind is like by talking about, you know, TV and entertainment and pop culture and things that everybody can relate to? That's how we're going to draw in the mainstream audience, like people who don't yet have a wallet, and then we'll teach them how to do that. Was that sort of like the goal when Dirt started? It wasn't a Web3 company from the start, but I entered into the picture early enough on that I would say this is like a Web3 native brand. And it's also like Dirt is a Web3 native brand that doesn't just address Web3. And I think that that's something that we're going to be seeing more and more. We're going to see media companies about anything that just happen to be using Web3 tooling. And a lot of that tooling will be as sort of invisible as a paywall is right now, where it's like, it'll be visible, but it'll be ancillary. It's a mechanic to access the things that people want to access and to engage with other people and content in the way that they want to engage. And I think a good example of that from sort of a different industry is we have a DAO exclusive newsletter that's only received by people in the DAO. And I wrote a little essay for today about this record label called Navak Collective, which is a record label operating off of a Web3 model where backers can buy an NFT. IP is sort of stored on Web2 and Web3. Um, And they're interested in sort of metaverse performance, like gamified catalogs, all the stuff that we associate with Web3. They have a singer that they represent named Rosa Lynn. She competed in Eurovision for Armenia. Then her song Snap, which she had competed with, took off on uh, TikTok and had something like 860,000 videos created using this song. The song started charting in Europe, top 10. And they struck a deal with Columbia Records to say, okay, we're going to co-represent her. And now it's cracking the Billboard 100 in the US. So my essay, the point of the essay was to say, everyone's asking what is going to be the Web3 breakout music moment? Like, is it going to be these Board Ape Yacht Club avatars at the VMAs where it's like, okay, that performance got attention, but is the did the music actually was the music actually popular? Well, not really. Like we see people who have, you know, avatars that they're performing with, music NFTs, everyone's saying what will be the Web3 breakout moment for music. And I was basically saying, like, that moment already happened and nobody realized it because Novak Collective was doing exactly what they should do, which is embrace the mechanics of Web3 to create things that will be culturally popular without sort of restricting themselves to this Web3 label. All of the people that heard that song on TikTok had no idea that it was coming out of a record label that is a Web3 record label. And now this is a a Billboard Top 100 hit. And so it was my way of saying like, some of the most successful stuff is going to be done with subtlety where... Web3 and the mechanics of it are not going to be foregrounded. What's going to be foregrounded is the actual cultural product. And that's the stuff that's going to take off. And that's sort of what we're aspiring to with Dirt. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. How do you think about balancing things like trying to reach a mainstream audience, which, you know, we still live in a very Web2 
world. And so if you are talking about things like reach and things like that, like SEO is important. Like you still have to sort of succumb to like some of the traditional web two methods of marketing and getting your content seen by people. How do you balance that with, you know, really trying to leverage web three native tools like NFTs and things like that to like like get people on board? Like, I I think I, my head is like constantly in conflict. Like there's like two sides of me that are in conflict with one another where I'm like, if you want to get a big reach, like if that is your goal, if your goal is to reach the mainstream audience in order to onboard those people to Web3, then you have to follow the traditional Web2 ways of reaching them because that's where they are. But at the same time, it's like once you're in Web3, it's so much more fun to like do things in a Web3 native way and use Web3 native tools. So how do you balance those two in, in your head when you approach Dirt? Yeah, I mean, I think social media and email are obviously still really important for distribution. And of everything that's being built in Web3, I haven't really seen anyone who's trying to replace email, um, which I think is like pretty telling. So we have about 15,000 email subscribers right now. We have 200 wallets in the DAO ecosystem. So we are really speaking to people across various platforms. We also receive a lot of traffic from social media. A lot of people who read our content may not necessarily be subscribed. So I think the ideal, as if we're kind of in this 2.5 space, is to build in a way where you're really not alienating anyone. Our audience really runs the spectrum from people who are, I think, NFT haters and kind of tolerate dirt because, you know, they skim over that stuff and they love the other stuff so much to, uh, the majority, which I think would probably say are like Web3 curious or like kind of have a healthy skepticism around it, but like think that it's probably going to be important in some way. And then like full native, all in Web3 investors, like ride or die maximalists. And we found a way to serve all of these audiences. And part of it is like reaching people where they're at with the content and with the mechanics. So like today, we launched the Dirt Wire, which is a bot that integrates with Discord channels and sends push notifications with Dirt content. So there's these notifications are somewhere between like an Apple News push alert and like a CoStar horoscope alert. So they're a short nugget that you could just read or you could follow to the original article. And they're written by humans. <laughs> so I, I was describing it as microdosing culture. And the purpose of that is so that other DAOs that have channels where people are supposed to be talking about movies and books which are like our most active channels, but maybe aren't the most active in their channels because they've attracted people that are primarily interested in talking about the floor, that they could integrate these with their culture channels and actually have like a steady drip of content for people to engage with and talk about. Um, And it allows you to subscribe only to certain topics. So every push notification is tagged. If you only want to subscribe to fashion because you just have a fashion channel, then you would only receive dirt wire notifications about fashion. So I feel like that's a pretty good example of us taking our fundamental product, which is really interesting cultural insights, finding a way to repackage that will reach people where we want to reach them. We want every DAO to use DIRT as a cultural conversation starter. And that's, this is one of our methods for doing that. Gotcha. On the editorial side, I'm curious with no longer having that pressure to like write clickbaity articles or titles or SEO optimize everything. What's your strategy with the pieces of content that you come up with? Like, how do you guys prioritize that? Think what's worth it to create and what's not? Um, honestly, like, is it good? <laughs> you know, like it sounds stupid and like a cop out, but like if it's interesting and it's good and it fits the sort of ephemeral idea of like what we think is dirty, like we'll run it. And sometimes that goes in like a very weird direction. But I think in aggregate, people can tell that there is a cohesive brand. So if you were following it for three days, you'd be like, this is very eclectic. But if you were following it for three weeks, you would be like, that's a dirt story. This is so dirt. And that's really the dream of a media brand. I think it's something that's like very hard to teach. And it's very hard to understand if you're coming from a background that is not content oriented or only understands content as like a conduit to marketing, you know, like, especially in tech where it's like, okay, everyone writes white papers, everyone has a podcast, 
present company excluded. <laughs> I don't think that you fall into this category. Like everyone sort of has a newsletter. So if you're going out to pitch an investor and they think of themselves as having a newsletter, it's a little bit like easy for them to undervalue it and say like, well, like big deal. I have a newsletter, but not all content is created equal, right? It's not all equally compelling. So that's something that we've sort of had to grapple with. I also think I've been saying for like a really long time, like eight months, that all NFT projects would have to pivot to being media companies in order to engage their fandom long term. And like we're seeing it happen with punks, we're seeing it happen with Board 8 Yacht Club, Yuga Labs is essentially a media company, right? They'll be very successful because they were already blue chips and they were already in the top tier. But there's a whole category of projects under that, right? Where, okay, they did raise a lot of money because they were operating in, you know, like a bull market. So all of these people came in through financial speculation. And now it's like, okay, what now? Most of them are going to have to find a purpose. And that purpose is probably going to be in the category of media. But not not everyone involved in projects that came about this way, like are going to know how to create good content, right? Like they're not going to have that muscle that I'm saying we're having, which is where you look at something, and you say, this is an excellent story. I know how to shape it. I know who the audience is for this. I know how to promote it. I know how to put a title on it. Not everyone's going to be do, able to do that. And especially in a market like this, I think that ability to pivot to being a media company, which is like, we started with the media first, we're doing the rest secondary for the people that started with secondary and they're going to media, like projects are going to live and die by their ability to do this. And I don't want to see projects fail, but I also think it's like a really important lesson about how much of the internet was really built around media and how little people creating that media actually profited off of that. Yeah. And for anybody listening who's a founder of a Web3 company or an NFT project or anything in Web3 who's like, oh shit, like I don't know how to do any of this. I need to get on it. When you're saying that every NFT project will need to eventually become a media company, which aspects of media do you see as being the most, like the highest impact for these NFT projects? Because there's so many things involved in media. And, you know, if people had to choose like they have limited resources, they have to start with something. Which platforms or channels or types of media do you see as most compelling for these like Web3 NFT projects? Well, I think it's going to be different for every project. It's going to be different for every audience. You know, some of them will probably be very video forward. We started with a newsletter. And the way that you incubate a newsletter list is sort of the same way that you would incubate a DAO, where a DAO, like, to me is not the endpoint social network. It's a way of collecting a bunch of wallets that you could build a social network on top of because you've identified, here's a bunch of wallets that have like a shared interest or a shared incentive. And so if you've created a DAO or you created an, a community of NFTs, rather than thinking of that as the endpoint, think of it as, okay, this is a collection of wallets, just like I might have a newsletter list, or I might have a list of people that watched my video. And I know that all of these people are interested in X, Y, and Z. What is the long-term media strategy that I would create to continue to engage their attention around X, Y, and Z? And it sounds simple, but it's like truly so hard. And I think if you, the first step is to recognize that it is hard. If you recognize that it is hard, then you're in a great position to develop a set strategy. If you think it's easy, you will fail. And that's not me being mean or like a snob or whatever. But like media is something that you have to learn. And even though we all sort of participate in it, just like we all tweet, but we can't all run the Wendy's account, right? That is not run by an intern. That is run by a social media professional. Um, and I think like media at large is the same way. Just like I had to learn about tech. I had to watch a lot of YouTube videos and Y Combinator videos to find out what a cap table was. And then, you know, I, and I learned and that took like humility and being willing to look stupid. And for anyone who's kind of transferring out of tech into something that's going to resemble a media company, even if it's going to resemble something like media companies that just didn't exist in Web2, I think it will require that same sort of humility and curiosity around, okay, like what actually makes compelling content and how do you build an audience around it? 
I think content and media is an area that almost requires the most humility because you can go and like learn about what a cap table is in the privacy of your home. And nobody even has to know that you didn't know what a cap table was at one point. I tell everyone though, because I think it's, you know, it's, it's a journey, right? For sure. Yeah. And I think anybody understands that. But I think with creating content, like the only way to get better at creating content is to create content. And content is such a public thing uh, that, you know, like you're you're really learning in public when you're learning about content and media and how to get better at that. So yeah, absolutely. It's a really good point. And, you know, Dirt is built like, de facto as a media company also building in public and publishing in public and you're right i think it's pretty scary but there are sort of there were investors who asked us like why not just build the rails for anyone to create their own newsletter brand in web3 and that is definitely a road that i could have taken but it was hard for me to wrap my head around for me the easiest thing for me to wrap my head around was to continue to create really compelling content and then build the ecosystem that we wanted around that. And then, you know, if it works, find a way to host other publications or sell it to other publications. There are people who are building Web3 Rails for content. The problem is people have to plug the content in. And so that's like actually a huge risk as well, because you need people to come and create good stuff on your platform or the platform itself isn't compelling. And what felt safer to me, but also like the thing that I was going to be excited to wake up every day and work on and fall asleep thinking about was start with the content, build the subscriber ecosystem around it using this tooling. And you might grow a little slower. People might not value you as highly, but you end up with something that's very concrete and will never go to zero because I always like one of my other catchphrases is media never goes to zero. There's always some value in what you've created. Absolutely. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the NFT side and the DAO side of DIRT. So for anyone who's unfamiliar, could you sort of give like the background into the DIRT NFTs? Like, how did you get the idea for it? What are the NFTs? And then like, what rights does it give holders in the DAO? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now we're sort of operating in beta where our DAO is functioning as a sort of editorial board for DIRT. So People who are holding DIRT tokens, um, which they received through purchasing our NFTs from these early crowd funds, some of them happened on Mirror, some of them happened directly on OpenSea. Uh, They're actually voting on story ideas that they want to see in the publication. Um, So that's like very cool. And it's also giving people the ability to participate in a publication to an extent that they never had before. Because if you look at Web2, it's like, okay, you can write a letter to the editor, you could leave a comment, but like, you don't really feel like a part of things that doesn't feel like a two-way street. They're not voting on everything that we put out, but we hold a vote at this point, at least like once a month for stuff that they're going to fund. And it's usually longer form stuff. Um, So that's sort of the beta version. In the long-term version, we were actually adding like another layer where you can be a subscriber, you can be a consumer, or you could be an investor. So if you're a subscriber, you could continue to receive dirt for free. There'll be a free daily dispatch that will go out. If you're a consumer, that means you're an NFT holder, which means you're holding an NFT subscription, which allows you to access what would otherwise be paywalled content, longer form stuff. And if you're an investor, you're a member of the DAO. So you've either been sort of transitioned in through the 200 token holders we have now, or you've purchased a founder pass that we'll release later this year. And that will entitle you to participate in the DAO and continue on down this pathway of DAO is sort of editorial board and like taste making conglomerate. Uh, so we're really adding just like in this other level that's very focused on the idea of an NFT as a subscription and going all in on this idea that like the wallet address will be the new fundamental unit of consumer data and that connecting your wallet will function in the way that having a paywall did in the past. It's deceptively simple or deceptively complicated, depending on which direction you're coming from. Right. So with the NFTs, are they uh, are they pieces of content that Dirt publishes that you turn into NFTs? And so is there like a constant stream of them or are they separate? No, they're artworks. Okay. So for the founder passes, we'll probably have about a thousand of them. The subscription will be an unlimited mint. So if you think about like a cover of a magazine, how that becomes sort of a limited edition collectible, we'll be issuing them on an annual basis. So if you buy the 2023 subscriber NFT, it's locked. You can't transfer it 
for a full calendar year, not beginning when you buy it, but beginning when it's issued. Um, so you hold on to that for the year. At the end of the year, you can either hold on to it as a collectible and buy the 2024, or you could sell it to somebody else. Uh, but then the 2024 NFT will be issued, new limited edition, totally new artist. You purchase it just like you would renew your subscription. Gotcha. Okay. So there isn't meant to be like a secondary market for the NFTs where holders can, you know, sell their NFT and make a profit or something like that. They might be able to at the end of the year or on a longer term basis. But to me, like the true value of that is not financial speculation. It's the utility of being able to access the content, which means that if there is going to be financial speculation, it would be around those um, limited a thousand founder passes. So we're sort of like balancing this idea that like we want something that's completely going to attract people that are interested in the utility and not financial speculation. But we're also like recognizing that if we only issue a thousand of these founder passes that like, you know, looking at groups like proof, there could become a secondary market for that tier, but we don't want there to necessarily be a secondary market for the subscriber tier. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm curious on the editorial side because so the, it sounds like the NFT primarily gives holders access to maybe some future token gated content. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But you also mentioned there's this like editorial piece where DAO members have a say in what gets published on Dirt. I'm curious about that process and how much of a say people get. How does that how does that process look like? Like, is it like I can submit? topics for dirt to write on or i can submit full-on articles to dirt or mm -hmm. i can veto like articles i don't like that are going to be published on yeah dirt. people actually like do suggest stuff in discord and we do take it into account but early on like i designed it and i kind of assumed that people would really want to play the role of an editor so kyle my co-founder and i we curated the ideas in advance so not everything that was submitted was presented to the dao but I chose like 15 ideas that I thought were good and appropriate. And I just presented them as they were presented to me as the editor. So some people write in with a story idea and it's like two sentences. And some people write in, they write three paragraphs about what they want to write. And the feedback that I, we got was actually, we want them to be all the same length and we want them to be less to choose from. So we started off with like a greater degree of choice and less curation than we've actually now landed on. Because people don't want to, like, if they're in the DAO, they don't want to create the content themselves. They don't want to play the role of an editor. They just want to have a way, like an easy way to have their taste reflected in the newsletter. Because they're following Dirt, because they find Dirt influences their taste, and they want to influence it back. And so this is like the core organic behavior that we figured out was the product audience fit for Dirt, which is like people who like to have their taste influence and people who like to see their taste reflected in what they consume. Um, and that is like, I think how I would describe the ideal dirt reader, dirt participant. And so what we've come to with these votes is a curated list of story ideas. They're all a similar length, no more than 10. And people do weighted voting and distribute their tokens across them. And then the winning idea is automatically commissioned. Super cool. Yeah, that's actually like pretty similar to how we our process for voting on podcast guests too is mm -hmm. I love the weighted voting feature too, because it really like gamifies the process so much more and makes people think in more strategic ways than they would if, you know, it was just like straight votes. Totally. I mean, we definitely have some like dirt whales that can really come in and like change the whole course of the vote. But the good thing is like, it's so it's fail proof, right? Because there's nothing in the list that's like a bad idea. Right. So there's no way for somebody to try to move it in a direction that would be damaging for the brand. Like they're only seeing good ideas and they're simply choosing their favorite. Yeah, I, I love that model. And then long term, then, do you plan to continue this model of people being able to submit ideas that they have for articles? Or it seems like long term, as you scale, that this process might become too cumbersome or might not no longer be feasible. Is, is that part of your long term roadmap, too? Or do you have other ideas for the long term? Yeah, well, the people pitching the ideas are writers. So they're pitching directly into the DAO. So instead of having 200 wallets participating, we would have a 1000 wallets participating in the vote. And I actually think that that will scale really well. But we will, I think, start adding in other ways of participation, like we might start to develop some commercial products or votes about merchandise. We did a vote about a t-shirt design earlier this year. So 
we'll be keeping this core sort of editorial board incentive, but we'll be expanding the ability of people to give input and we'll have 1,000 watts participating rather than 200. Do you ever see DIRT decentralizing content creation in the sense that you'll have more than just the DIRT writers be able to write for DIRT and have, you know, some like more decentralized model? I think I can see us decentralizing recommendations around cultural products. I don't see us decentralizing actual content creation. Discord right now works really well for people recommending things to each other. And I would love to have a way to formally confer benefits to people who are really active in doing that and really like productive in saying, hey, I love this TV show. But I don't think they want to write. They like want to enjoy the content. And to be honest, like everyone has to sort of pick a lane in this. And I'm falling pretty hard into the lane that I don't think decentralized content creation is going to work. It's not going to work the way that people think it's going to work for sure. And, you know, I've chosen a pretty strong stance on that. There's people who I really respect who are like on the opposite end of the spectrum with CCO and, you know, various forms of incentivizing people to use an NFT project's IP to create whatever they want. Um, not everyone's good at that, you know? So I think like a better use of this tooling is to create a way for people to engage with it in a better way um, for an audience to feel like it's more of a two-way street between the creator and themselves, the fan or the publication and the reader without expecting that the reader is going to want to take the super active participant role. Yeah, for sure. Ideally, I would like to be bullish on decentralized content. But in practice, I haven't really seen a good model yet for how that could work out. The way I think of it is like, we might be able to decentralize content at the creation layer, but there needs to be a curation layer that is a lot more centralized. And it's kind of like in your case, like anybody can submit an idea for a topic that they want to see written about. But ultimately, there's a curation layer on top of that, which is you and whoever else on your team, the editorial board that ultimately decides like what actually gets written and what doesn't. And I think totally. that like with content, I think that curation layer, that like a little bit more centralized layer is just unavoidable because otherwise there's no good way for like quality control, at least that I've thought of. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. So long term, like looking ahead to the next five years, what do you see as maybe some like new media models that you see emerging that you think we can expect to see um, coming about in the next like five years? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to give away all of my alpha. But I will say that if you look at brands that have really successfully paired editorial and e-commerce and web two. So I mean, like the Mr. Porters of the world, the Hodinkies of the world, the food 52s of the world, brands like that built from the start to be blockchain native, I think are going to be even more successful because if you build on the blockchain, editorial and e-commerce are integrated from the start. And so I think it'll be taking the learnings from work worked really well in web two and adapting them to web three. I also think that some of the community models that were not particularly successful in media, like having a comment section where people could be anonymous and say whatever they want, like we're going to see less of that right now. Discord is sort of a place for back and forth conversation and moderation around people who want to give feedback on content or are participating in a project. I think we're going to see like new forms of community that essentially function like small social networks and that DAOs are going to become social network incubators, including DIRT. So those are sort of my broad strokes predictions. Those are what I'm using as like my North Star. Um, and I figured out a way to adapt that for my company and that I think works for us and will work for our investors. But I'm excited to see what other people come up with. When you say social network incubator, are you saying that there's going to be like in the future, instead of having, you know, five or a handful of major social platforms that will actually see tons of different ones. So like Dirt might have their own social network, Rehash might have their own social network, and there's going to be like all these different little ones instead of, you know, what we have today with like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, exactly. I think we're going to see social networks that are built for as few as 10,000 wallets, and they will start to consolidate as they accrue interoperability with other social networks. 
So we're not going to move away from this cycle of decentralization and recentralization. This is just like, that's like a historic pattern in technology, things disperse, and then they, you know, like you collapse, they consolidate, right? But before they consolidate, we're going to see a lot of these small social networks. And then we're going to see a lot of them merging. Um, and hopefully the product, the end products will be more healthy than what we have now. I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm participating so that that can happen. But it's challenging. You know, we're dealing with human beings here and now very intelligent machines. So, you know, I, I don't know what the alternative is other than to participate and try to bend things to my ideology and my values. Yeah, that's that's pretty much. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100 percent. Um, all right. Well, to wrap up, Daisy, I have five questions that I ask everybody at the end of every podcast episode. These are some are related to Web3, some are not. They're kind of just random, quick little ones. So the first question I have for you is, if you get to rebrand any one thing in Web3, and it's guaranteed to stick, what do you rebrand? Oh, my gosh. Um, oh, there's a word that I like really hate, and I'm trying to remember what it is. Is it one of those buzzwords that everybody on Twitter uses all the time that like doesn't actually mean anything? Totally. But like now I can't remember what it is. Um, oh, yeah, soul, soul bound NFTs. Oh, I think yeah. people have stopped talking about that, but like let it die. No, it's not a thing. That's so that's one of them. Yeah, for sure. What would you rebrand that to? Like, what would you call it instead? Just like nothing. Like it's an NFT, right? Like it's like saying that like you can have different layers to like buying things. You know, people buy things that they're very attached to. They buy things that they're not super attached to. I think it's just like not a super useful like consumer designation. And like we should find a better way of describing the behavior to say like super fan or super collector or like long term collector um, and not really put, try to conflate the behavior with the consumer product, if that makes sense. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I've, uh, tweeted many times how much I hate this word and I've been lectured that it actually comes from a gaming like the gaming world in the gaming world this idea of like soul bound items is nothing new and so I guess people that come from okay. the gaming world like inherently understand it but to the I rest mean, they of might, us. but like gamers also hate web3 so I wouldn't like put too much <laughs> stock in like catering to them I also am like I mean I joke that I'm canonically a hater I'm not a hater but like you know, I've developed my personal taste such that I'm very comfortable saying, you know what, I don't like that. Like everyone will be buying it. Like the floor could be going up. But like, if I think it's ugly, I'm not buying. Um, and, you know, I'm in like a telegram chat with a lot of like really amazing movers and shakers in Web3. And like, everyone is like very positive, you know, critical, but like positive. And sometimes I feel like I'm the one who's like, you know, everyone's like, wow, amazing. This is fire. And I'm like, eh, it sucks. <laughs> But you know what, like, whatever, I think people trust you more if you're willing to be both positive and negative. And really early in like a tech movement, when there's like a lot of camaraderie, and there's like a lot of overlap between creators and investors, like, nobody wants to like really rock the boat. But it's also really important to say like, when the emperor has no clothes. And like, if you are texting your friends in like a side chat saying like, this is the ugliest NFT I've ever seen, but then you're like tweeting that people should buy it, like, it makes you a little bit dishonest and it's okay. Like if that's what your role is going to be, but like, I really see my role as, you know, being honest, like telling it like it is creating good content, creating content that will allow people to contextualize things and contextualize what their own personal taste is going to be in web three. So it's okay for me to be a little bit of a hater. Yeah. Or, or if you're honest about the dishonesty, like if you're just yeah. like straight up, I hate this art, but I'm in it for the money and this is going to blow up. And that's why I'm buying it. And you should too. I mean, I that's respect that. Too. <laughs> yeah, I respect it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, second question. If you could wave a magic wand and any Web3 app, tool, or protocol would immediately exist, what would you want that to be? Oh, such a good question. You know what it is? This is inspired by some tweets by Dame. What I would want is the ability to block crypto bots responding to tweets about NFTs. Um so, you know, a, a simple solution um, that we're sorely in need of. Yeah, that, that honestly can't be too hard to build. I'm kind of surprised it doesn't already exist. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Third question. If Dirt were a famous person or animal or character from history or pop culture, who would it be? Wow. Well, so Dirt, we have a mascot, Dirty, who's like an anthropomorphic clod of dirt. Um, we've talked a lot about like, 
what Dirty's predecessors might be. You know, there's like this mud monster in the game Candyland. I don't remember what the mud monster is called, but I really feel like he might be a distant relation of Dirty. And so we're also always trying to sort of identify like creatures that feel like they might be distant relatives of Dirty. So I'm going to go with that. Okay. It's been a number of years since I've played Candyland, so I'll have to go back and look that up. Yeah, I'll look up a picture for you. You're going to see, it's going to like activate a core memory of yours. (laughs) Probably, most definitely. Very 90s. I might be older than you though. So anyway, it was something we played in the 90s. I'll ask you for your age offline after this. Um, (laughs) The fourth question I have is, if money were no issue, would you still be doing what you're doing now or would you be doing something else? You know, if I was set for life, I would maybe probably spend less time online, but I would still be interested in building the future of media. So that's like a little bit of a paradox, right? But you know, I've gone through periods where I really didn't have that much money at all when I was working as a freelance writer. And I knew I could make more money doing something else, but that's what I really wanted to do. So I think there's just a consistency in my character, in my, the way that I relate to culture in the world that has drawn me to working on these problems of media. And as my resources have increased, I've been able to work on them at a different level, but this is what I love. So I think I would be doing it no matter what. Love it. And then last question, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Mm, I think if I could live anywhere in the world, I would want to have a city option and a country option, which is, I guess, sort of what I have now. And I also like have not had the opportunity to live overseas. And that's something that I would really love to try. I love the state of Maine. I love the ocean. I also love being in New York City, the energy of New York City and the energy of cities like London and big cities like that. So I think the ideal lifestyle for me is not having to be rooted to one place, but having a couple different home bases where I could be the rural version of myself and the most urban version of myself, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I super relate to that and your last answer. Like I always say my ideal place to live would be like New York City in the mountains, which yeah. obviously doesn't exist. But that paradox of like wanting to be offline and like not be in front of my screen all the time, but then having all of my career interests be rooted in technology is sort of like that, you know, push and pull that I, yeah, I relate to that 100%. Yeah. And I think like the true value of the next wave of the internet is going to be finding ways to create value for people when they're not logged on. And so that's something that Dirt is really cognizant of as well. Like we want it to have value for people when they're not plugged in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I can't wait to see where Dirt is headed. I'm definitely going to be following along, maybe try to snag one of those early passes if they're still available. Um, But before you go, Daisy, tell people where they can find you if they want to follow you and also where they can go to sign up for dirt or buy an nft uh, or anything else you want to plug yeah totally right now we have all of our links consolidated on a sort of like temporary website so dirt.fyi if you go to dirt.fyi you'll get all the links to our social networks the link to our Substack, which is the main newsletter product and then link to our discord and then if you want to follow me my twitter is days and confused d-a-i-s and confused you can follow me for uh, really excellent memes, if I do say so myself, um, and the occasional web free insight. Love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Daisy, for taking the time to come on the podcast. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in, as always. And we'll be back again next week with another episode of Rehash. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Rehash, a web three podcast. The guest from this episode, Daisy Alioto was nominated by Karsten and voted onto the podcast by Dame, Ane, and Karsten. Some of the questions you heard were submitted by Karsten. Rehash is hosted by Diana Chen, produced and edited by Ellie Dots and Tyler Internet, sponsored by Lens, Avenue, and Govern, and as always, supported by Rehash Dow. To stay up to date on all things Rehash, you can follow us on Twitter at RehashWeb3 and join our Discord to get involved.